Um, what dog are you doing? Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about we're going to talk about what makes a good product in publishing, and let's start with getting with killing a couple of myths. Yes. No, most notably, the myth that the best books all come out of New York. Yeah. Because I think we have plenty of people sitting here with us right now who would not only disagree, but disprove that. So, <clears throat> we're going to go down the list and you can tell me why people think that and what you're doing to, and what you're doing to threaten and or shatter that myth. And alien races first. Let's start with CS first. <laughs> I still could have started with uh, Alex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw her ears go up. I thought it was the other. <laughs> well, okay, why do we think that? Why do we think okay, that? I think because, A, we've been told that. We've been told that uh, over Nazi. and over and over again. Uh, we're still being told that. Uh, I think there is some value to having a gatekeeper. This is one of these things that, oh, you know, Historically, this is the way things have been done. They've worked very well for the select few for whom they've worked very well for. Um, and it has not been possible until recently to really break through this uh, this barrier uh, with without so much pain and suffering and, and scorn and ridicule and, and, and a stigma that won't fade. Uh, it's been very, very difficult indeed to be an independent author or even a small press author is difficult. Um, as the ebook revolution has blown things wide open, because that's really what's blown things open, uh, we find that now uh, the, the concept of the gatekeeper, while still valuable, it is valuable to have books vetted for quality. It is valuable to have a stamp on the book that says someone has looked at this and deemed it at least reasonably well edited. Uh, there is some value in that. However, uh, because the economy is not real good, the big six are having difficulty selling things. They're they're only taking on new authors, and from what I've seen lately, whose books are similar to other big selling authors. They won't take you on if they don't think you can sell a gajillion copies for them. And the result of that is an awful lot of talent goes on. Uh, unexposed to the light and not brought into, into the reader's light. Um, me, you know, to bust the myth, uh, first of all, I think it's it's just not really necessarily a myth, but it's an idea whose time is passing. Um, I think it may have been true at one time. Now I don't think it's, it, it, it's near as much so. Um, so what I did is just wrote the best quality book I could write. I went at it with the intention of being independent. I never did seek traditional publishing. I just decided I was going to do it this way because I had a story I wanted to share. I made sure that I went through all the same steps that a publisher goes through. I had professional editors. I had, you know, my cover art is okay. Um, I had professional cover designers look at it and critique it for me and help me with it. I had help with my back cover copy. Um, I just I made sure it was absolutely perfectly formatted and presented in a way that was professional quality, much as I could <coughs> deem. And then it still sat and languished in the stigma of self-publishing until the ebook revolution came along and allowed me to have a level playing field. So I think you know for all of us, any of us are either small press or indies. It's the ebooks that have allowed us to compete in this arena. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think one of the myths um, has begun to be started because New York has put out consistently good books and they put out consistently commercial and popular books. So perception is led by numbers. And so that's why they think only those can be good books because so many have been sold and that many people can't be wrong. And you know, as we're talking about, now that there are more platforms, there are different ways to deliver books to the reader. You can put up much larger numbers than you used to be able to put up, and people will sit up and take notice. Um, 
the uh, myth busting that I will do, and thank you so much for letting me brag. It's really good of you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is um, number 20 on the Amazon Kindle list right now. This is um, Jim Marie Landis, she's a USA Today bestseller, um, a New York Times Plus author, fabulous author. We're delighted to publish her in a new genre. Mysteries, a brand new genre for her. That's fabulous. But we've done this with other authors. This is a brand new author, first book. This in particular, this is not my author that I edited. This is my author that I edited. Worked with her for two years on the book. Um, it sat at number one on the Kindle list for 16 days in the top 100 for over a month. Can't, I can't remember where it is now, maybe. 400 or 500 or something, um, and just been an absolutely tremendous, wonderful book. So it can be done, you know, by the small and mid-major press, um, and it can even be done by people who are self-publishing. It has been done. Let's look at Amanda Hockey. It's a little more rare, but I think that we are busting the myths because the readers are seeing that good quality books can come from uh, independent places that they're not used to seeing. Um, my my take on why the myth is there. At one time, New York houses were run by people who knew and loved books. They, you know, editors who actually read. Um, editors who knew the craft. Run by editors, period. It was run, yeah, part. the houses so were run, run by numbers. The, yeah. the houses were run by numbers, by, by, by editors, until mergers, acquisitions from there. The only U.S. owned publisher that I'm aware of, made one of the majors, is Bain. Uh, everybody else is, is owned out of Germany, and it's run by bean counters. Um, that is that is. And even Bain's wearing shackles. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I am. I am not a small press. I describe myself as a nano press. <laughs> I like that. Uh, it's a one woman operation, and I'm a woman. Um, now, granted, there's a lot of me to go around, but um, I started Harp Haven Publishing not because I wanted to buck New York, not because I wanted to, you know, strike a blow for independence. I, I, I had a, a film CD I wanted to get out, and I needed I needed a name on the on the on the copyright. Um, and then I then I had an audio book I wanted to get out, and I needed a name on the copyright. And I already and, and gee, ISBN numbers they're cheaper if I buy them by ten, you know, by ten of them than going through somebody else. Uh, plus, which I've been working, you know, I had the privilege of working with good independent with a good at one time independent publisher. So I had, you know, and I had been in the business peripherally for years, magazine editor. It's nonfiction, but still it was editing. Um, the Ladies of Trade Town sold to publishers twice. Once to Misha Merlin, once to Norlana. Misha Merlin, it was in the pipeline, pipeline when Misha Merlin went tits up. Um, I had writers under contract by two days when Norlana advised me that they were postponing the book for a year and the contract said pay on both. And I, I crunched numbers. I had already put out a, a nonfiction compilation, so I knew the mechanics. I knew I could do the mechanics. Um, I, I crunched numbers. I, I didn't ask my husband for money, but I said, you've got to answer the phone, shove sandwiches under the door, tell people I died, I'll call him back in two weeks. Um, and when, when he said, yeah, I'll do that, uh, I, I hit the ground running. I looked at, at Vera at Norlana and said, I'm buying it back. Um, a year later, no, eight months later, this is what I did. Um, I think the quality, the physical quality is as good as anything sitting in Barnes & Noble. Um, yeah, it's a little rough. It's some of the layout, but I'm learning. It's, it's the first one of these. Will not be the last. I had a good time. Um, for me, ebook publication did not lead it. You know, the trade is the lead. Ebooks are coming along second. That's what we do. Um, Print first, ebooks as quickly as we can get them out after. Yeah, um, for me, as quickly as we get them out is, you know, a couple of weeks. Now, I had the very good fortune um, to, there's a convention that I helped start their writer track about 15 years ago. 
it's an 18,500 attendee anime con with one kick ass rider track. And when they, when I and I was talking to the the folks over there about what I was doing because they you know they invited me out to a, a lot to some to to a function I said I can't I'm doing a final edit um, and they went huh and I told them what I was up to and the next thing I know they're throwing me a book launch <laughs> um, a four hour catered by the hotel at the top of the ad what used to be the Adams Market downtown Dallas full formal they brought in as many of my writers who could come in. I br they brought me in minions um, to, 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 keep, to keep me from going stark staring bonkers. Uh, we did we did a panel that introduced everybody. We did a mass signing that that was very popular. We sold half of the first print run, and it was the likes of which New York doesn't do anymore. Now, you know, what I did to deserve this, I have no idea, but I ain't going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> but the quality, you know, the product, I, you know, I think I'm a good editor as far as story selection. I've got some damn fine stories in this thing. And this looks as pro as anything I've seen coming out of New York. I'm proud of this, sir. Uh, the myth of New York. I think it's exactly that. I think it has always been a myth. Okay. Of Walt Whitman, Weathering Heights. Oscar Wilde, uh, I can just, uh, the, the heyday of the great uh, rivalries in the newspapers. You know, if you wanted to pick a fight, you know, you, you know, if you were Oscar, you'd pick a fight with Oscar Wilde, and you'd be invited to parties for the next two years, and that's how you ran up your readership, that's how you ran up your, uh, that's it, I need to pick a fight with Amanda Hawking. <laughs> Of you know, I'm act, I, I keep actually offering to write something for a book party. I, anything <laughs> they want of mine, I will be more than happy. Just you know, the Twilight so fans. How, I, so you know, how do we take off the tea baggers? You know, it's a. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I think it has always been a scam. I think the reason I don't think New York has been putting out good books. I think New York has been putting out the books they want you to buy. And I think that's all about money. And I think that goes back to Hearst. I think that goes back to. Putnam. I think that goes back to anybody out there who wanted to play favorites and play uh, reputation. Now, of course, there's still a game here where if somebody became famous for some reason, you had to put out their book. And that's never changed. Now, the reason you become famous has, has <laughs> you know, the reason you become famous, you, know, you are a sports star or you are a war hero or, you know, and as we've all know from history, a lot of that was also created. Um, you know, it's, New York has always been for the money, by the money, with the money. That's how the money works. Of uh, there have also been great examples throughout history of, of wonderful self-published or independently published uh, works that have always done fine and are still with us today. Of uh, with that said, I think New York for the last thirty years, and I'm going to blame it all on Peter Benchley. Um, books became movies. When a book became a movie, and what I mean by that is I don't mean we made a movie from a book. I even go back to Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley was the first big media star. They didn't make movies out of books back then, you made plays. Mary Shelley, Frankenstein the play was all the rage. And Ron Stoker. Jack, Jacqueline Hyde and you know all of these things were the great media creations of their day and they are still with us and they are still great and classical but I, I believe it's about uh, about Peter Benchley is when we had a book turned down oh gosh 50 times something silly like that before a publisher took a chance on it and it really caught the public's attention and then it ran like a movie. Suddenly we were talking movie numbers with just a book. And then we made a movie at it. And the movie made billions of dollars for its day. Uh, and now suddenly New York got a taste of the blockbuster. And suddenly everybody's a blockbuster. Uh, there are a lot of fantastic writers walking around this convention today that would be good, solid, mid-list writers for New York that would crank out good, consistent product and would be a profit center. If your publishing company can't make money at 20,000 books, there's something wrong. Yeah. 
but they don't want to sell 20,000 books. They want to sell 20,000 books this week. So this, fig this figure that gets bandied about, about 90% of traditionally published or New York published books losing money. Is oh. this the same syndrome as we see? We know Babe Ruth is the home run king, mm -hmm. but he's also the strikeout king. Correct. Brett Favre threw more touchdowns than anybody. Correct. He also threw more interceptions. Correct. It's a numbers game. Is it because New York goes for the long ball? New York doesn't go for the long ball. Not yeah. long tail. I mean, they go for the home run every hit instead of they, they trying go to go the, for a base hit. They go hit. for the known... They want the quick kill. They want the quick kill. They and want if, if we had a movie tomorrow about ugly vampire ducks that made $100 billion as the fluke because it was the very first ugly vampire duck movie, we would have killer waterfowl for the next seven years. Yeah. an anthology idea. Uh, <laughs> Well, it, it's true. You, I see you, something here. Yeah, you know, <laughs> if you go to new, you, if you've ever gone to a movie meeting, these people sit around and they're very, very, very focused on. Well, that movie made money. Look at the amount of remakes coming out of Hollywood. Look at look at the amount of retread coming out of Hollywood. Oh, excuse me, it's imagined. Just, <laughs> no, I'll stick with tread. I'll yeah, with yeah, tread. Well, they pulled the nails out of it. Of what are we doing to break this? Mm -hmm. Of the process of breaking the stranglehold on publishing has been going on for 200 years. It's just now cheaper, faster, and easier. Uh, and and allows more schlock in. The problem is the gate is open. The gate is open, and most of what comes through, quite honestly, and I'm speaking here as, as an editor, sucks rocks. It does. Most of it is, However, <laughs> most of it should never, if there was any kind of gate at all. It shouldn't make it the to market. the gate. It shouldn't make it to the gate, let alone through it. It's there, a little mesh that would help. <laughs> you know, any well, mesh at all. Well, it's a commercial that came out a few years ago from HP. I absolutely hated it. Yeah. And this is before I was officially a publisher. As a writer, I hated it. The English professor is being his usual pompous, acerbic self. I would have no knowledge of how that works. Oh, and, uh, yes, yes. And uh, he is, you know, pontificating that all of you want to be writers, yet none of you are going to make it. One person in a thousand is ever going to see paper. And there's one little smart aleck in the back that goes, excuse me, because of HP's digital technologies, everybody can be published. And you're like, no. Oh, I'm sitting there going, oh, God, no. And, you know, really, that was amazingly the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, well, and again, I think there's a distinction there. Everyone can be published, not everyone can be well read. I think that's the goal. I think standard. quality that's what we will need to out. Get to. Yeah, and I think quality will out. You've got to get out. a readership. Quality so will out. Bottom. On the other hand, direct sales. Yes, as well. Good particularly, yeah. particularly yeah. if you're Amazon and give away direct, so you can get. You know, we're selling X number of, of Kindle editions. Go through the list. Well, the first hundred or so, I mean, by and large, are free. Is not necessarily well, they've been scamming the top 100 list for 100 years. Yeah. Because the 100 list is not retail sales like most people think it is. No. Bookstores do not report that. That is reported by the distributors. Well, the New York by Times the number goes of out units moved. on their handwritten list of what they think might should be on the list. Correct. Booksellers have well, to write you in. Donaldson's so. um, Ill Earth War exposed that the New York Times bestseller list was a complete sham because he was outselling nearly everyone on the list, but because he was quote-unquote sci-fi, he wasn't getting any respect. And they put him, well, he's on our genre list. And they went, well, look at the numbers. He's yep. kicking the real list in the teeth because, you know, uh, now he was, now this is before Harry Potter. This yeah. is 20 years ago. Yeah. And there were people at bookstores at midnight in malls to buy a book that was not cute. Yeah. The Ill Earth War was not cute. It's some acerbic, miserable guy with leprosy. <laughs> and I, I just, threw it across the room after four pages, okay? I but there this. were people standing in malls to get their hands on this book. And he was had really good numbers, but... New York has been pumping and thumping those numbers for for a hundred years. There's because a, there's a, there's an old story about an author who got hold somehow of the super secret bookstore list and set up a book tour for her first month, 
with the super secret bookstore list. Yeah, the ones you're supposed to go to. And yeah. gamed the system and made the list by doing her by doing two weeks, putting her face in those bookstores. So now, so, I, so bestseller lists are yeah. well, to subject crumble, to, to manipulation. Crumble New York, and I don't think New most York is crumbling. Care so much about the bestseller list as they care about numbers. Yeah, we all love the bestsellers list, and we all love to say, yeah, we're on the full paid list. Yeah, you know that was at full price, whatever. But it's still the bottom line is numbers. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, seventy thousand if you're pulling good numbers from one of the other revenue streams. So part, I think, of the of good foundations of publishing is making sure the product is available in more than just one venue. Because you've got to find well, yeah, leadership. The, the, the days the leadership of picking and choosing are over. Oh yeah. You know, that the hardcover would come out, and then six months later, the trade or large print edition would come out, and then they would bid the mass market, and, they, you know, basically they milked a book four times. Yeah. Uh, today, since, I would say since the year 2000, the consumer, especially in the intellectual property market, because of the video games and because of all the digital stuff, the consumer now does not wait. Uh, it's just blunt. They don't wait. Um, if the book comes out, they want the collectible edition. They want it today. They don't want to wait six months for it. They they want the ebook. They, oh they yeah, don't I've, wait I've run into that. Six months. They don't want to wait a year for for something to change. Well, and I'm telling you, everything in that industry, the, the, the traditional big six quagmire, moves with the speed of a striking slug. I've yeah. never <laughs> seen. Anything moves so slowly in all my entire life. It's entrenched. It's it's yeah. enough to give me more gray hairs than I remember. Nope. <laughs> I mean, it's just like you know, can, you people can't get anything done in in less than a year. You know, no. I I, uh, I mean, if most if most businesses ran their affairs the way New York Publishing does, we'd still all be you know full of rickshaws and drugs. Oh, we'd still have buggy horseless whips. carriages. Yeah, we'd still know. have buggy whips. Uh, <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very big thing. <laughs> so, and sees absolutely no reason to move any faster. So one of the things that you guys brought up is that is this concept of the disappearing gatekeeper. Yeah. Or, oh or perhaps the shifting gatekeeper. Because he used to be the editor. This is where I'm going to make enemies, I can tell. <laughs> there aren't enough of us in the room. Because the gatekeeper used to be the editor. Find my way out of this. <laughs> then the gatekeeper was the agent because the slush pile got moved. Yep. Now, is the gatekeeper the reader no. or not? Because I, forgive me, but by the time the reader gets to it, it's too late. Yeah. Okay. Um. There was a okay, hey. Those of us who read slush understand that. 90, I'll say 95 and be generous. That's very nice. Comes in, is pure and utter crap. Um, it's, it, some of it's illiterate, some of it is bad writing, some of it owes a, owes a great deal to to somebody's fan fiction. Mm -hmm. At least they can file the serial numbers off better. Um, <laughs> Or the writer believes in better living through chemistry, and that's when they write. Oh yeah, I can tell those too, and those are those are fun. I don't ever Sam Coleridge. Oh boy. Um, I knew Sam Coleridge, so, and you're no Sam Coleridge. Yeah. <laughs> when um, you know, at at that point, somebody's got to say, uh-uh. You know, look for the look for the good stuff. Get that out. That's the editor's job. Even in, you know, small press, nano press, it doesn't matter. For self-published. You know, particularly the ones that go straight to ebook. Those who are not invested in any way, there is no, there's, there is no, nobody's put anything on the line. You know, for success or failure. I just want to see my name in print. So, what saves the reader from the slush? Well, from this moving pile of slush. I think I, we're going to see the bookstores becoming gatekeepers at some point. Can, can I? They say already are. As I, I think actually Amazon. Is the gatekeeper for it. you? I, on my, I own a bookstore. Yeah. You know, my my uh, readers come in, and you know they will tell me it's like, yeah, I was thinking about getting this book, but you know, Amazon has 
10 bad reviews on it and nothing, you know, 10 one star reviews, no five star reviews, they're not going to buy it. I, readers will not buy. And sadly, Amazon, and Amazon, Amazon and my people, those are 12 year olds who run around, but, but have never gotten past a big chief reader. And but they're the investigating. Right they're, they're absolutely slamming Book works, selling. and yeah. also for publishers, it's usually somebody you turn down that now hates your guts. True. They're called yeah. trolls, and yeah, oh, yeah and you're you're getting trolled. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, but still, I mean, but by the by, pick a troll. five of the I think yeah. I have eight one star reviews between my three uh, books of the trilogy, trilogy, which that's okay. <laughs> Everybody yeah. has. I wish I could. But five of those I wish are I from another independent author. Who has never read anything of mine? I've never met him. I've never corresponded or mentioned his name in public or anything else. He just decided he was going to knock down a bunch of other independent authors, and he went after not only my books but quite a number of other indies books. Uh, we were all kind of sitting around, like, "What? Huh?" And then, of course, the idiot went after Patrick Crawford. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it's like, just for fun, he decided he'd throw Pat in there, and of course, he has millions of fans who ferreted this guy out. So now, all of a sudden, we're like, oh, it's oh, okay, okay. You know, the this thing is, is the this, casual observer doesn't know the backstory of these. No, well, right. in reviews reviews can be manipulated yeah, they can in various be manipulated, directions. But you know, if you're if if you've got something on Amazon, you're going to get reviews. If it's any good, there will be positive reviews. If it's bad, majority of them will be bad reviews. You will not be getting good reviews unless it's a good book. I now think we're back to word of mouth, however. Yeah, and that's, I, I, but I, I mean, we're we're past the internet at this stage. I think people have learned. Yeah, or not, they are learning. Yeah, but you can you can breathe. You know, it's moving from Amazon to Goodreads now, and you know, library thing. You know, there there all those sites. You know, it's the reviews of it's it's the internet is the gatekeeper now. You know what? That's a scary that's, thought. I've said, that a lot of times. I've said that a lot of times. Now, that, now books that are that comment, I will agree with completely. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah the internet is the gatekeeper. I will yeah. not say any one avenue. Yeah, it, it's the. Internet. I, I would completely vehemently argue against Amazon being the gatekeeper, but yeah. I would definitely agree that it is now people's blogs. Yeah. It is now it's, people's suggestions. It is now the new word of mouth. Is the gatekeeper. Well, it, well, and gatekeeper also, it's not just what are the, who's gatekeeping for the reader, but who's gatekeeping for the writer. I think we have two different types of gatekeeper that we're talking about. Um, the cultural arbitration that Amazon and the blogs and the reviewers are doing is sort of gatekeeping for the reader. For the reader, yeah. But the bookstores in Amazon, Barnes & Noble, how they run their platforms, they're kind of gatekeeping for the writer what they're going to let in, what they will let the independent writers do, what promotions will let them in. So there, there are some, some I, things I think that they're they're. I think that's completely driven by a number. Yeah. I think that's, I think if you, I think, I think there's going to be the next little, so, somebody's going to beat the system and something that is just completely utter garbage is going to beat the system and it's going to be the best well, thing. That ever. always happens, but that doesn't mean that Amazon is going to open up their regular vendor portals to independent presses. There and, you have. Um, there you have. There you have. Not well, self-published, I have No. Uh, all right. You can game. You can figure out how to game. If a self, the if 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 a, all right. They're they're not doing it to the person that does not know how to publish. If you know how to publish, you can get in that door. I if did. You do not know how to publish. Now again, now this is a little bit of a gatekeeping. That's gatekeeping. It's a little bit of gatekeeping. That's gatekeeping. Yeah. Of, but there are already people beating that system. They're only beating it because they're doing a decent job. No. And that's still no. They're no, already. They're no. But they're they're already massive it. scammers. Massive, massive, yeah. horrifyingly terrible crap by the pound being flushed in by clever programmers, not writers. Most of it involves pulling stuff off Wikipedia and yeah. packaging it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. By the by the thousands. To the point where it was slowing them down significantly. Uh, yeah, no there there are the clever pro there no matter what mousetrap we build, I promise there's a clever programmer out there that will jack it up. Just you know, it's, it's the hacker mindset all over again. Yeah. I, I actually go back to, we're actually getting back to old-fashioned publishing, though. I know we all the newfangled gizmos, but the business itself, I think, 
Can I, I at least really have? Can I at least have the movable type? Yeah, but yeah, well, but, but, but I mean, by good old fashioned publishing, we're back to, and I, I love your books, in the good old fashioned publishing sense, that you're here. You're here at the convention. You're, yeah. you're talking to your got, you're you, talking you, to your fans. You you are you are doing the the old Oscar Wilde. You are going to the parties and you are meeting the fans and you are you are creating that buzz and you are doing good old it's, fashioned everyday business. It's back in the hands of the authors to do the marketing and yeah. build up them. She is a star. Well, that, that's, that's true. And brand name. No matter who your publisher well, that, is. Well, yeah, that doesn't that's matter true. who it is. But you, you're seeing it more and more in the small press authors. The bigger, the bigger, you know, the big six. If they start pushing them, you'll get the people that are doing. You know, Brandon Sanderson is all over the place right now. Yeah. But he's been doing that before he was even, you know, right. a little time. What am I talking about? Examples? The endangered species in you publish. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what is the endangered species? The the surviving midlist writer. Yeah. The it middlest happens. writer with no day job. It happens, but it's but. becoming more and more rare. One of the um, no big six job. editors, I was on a panel in Colorado, and um, she was, I can't remember what the rant was about, but she was going, you people have to get it into your heads. We never sit down at the beginning of the day and go, I can't wait, I hope I can find another midlist writer today. <laughs> midlist happens because you don't crack the A-list. So, you know, that's that's the problem with being a working midlist writer is it's not a spot. They're not looking for that. They're looking for A and you end up in B or the C right. list. This right. No one, this no one wakes up and says, this is what I want to be. I want to be a midlist. I want to play triple A ball. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> really. Um, and you can sometimes look into it and make a living, but if, you're, if your numbers just sort of flatline, then there could be decent numbers and you can keep your advances. But you're not going up, and you're not getting publisher support, which means you're not getting a strong selling, you're not getting an increased print run, and it's just sort of a cycle that spins down. So. Most of the midlist authors that I've met uh, have been unhappy with their situation. They wish they had more control. They wish they had more freedom. They, they live in fear of declining sales. And it is, and, and they don't have the power to go out and really change their fortunes the way you know. With independence, Lord love us, you know, we we at least have no one to blame but ourselves. <laughs> we also have the power to change things for the better when we see something that isn't working. Um, and that is a very very large plus as far as I'm concerned with being an indie or. I mean, most of the small press authors I know have a relationship with their publisher that would allow them to sit down and talk with their editor and talk with, say, look, you know, I think our marketing isn't working and this is why, and, and would, you, would you consider trying uh, Plan B? Uh, if you try that with a, with a major publisher, they, they may get back to you in six months. The other thing is that they uh, they probably will completely blow you off, and, and because of course you can't possibly know uh, as much as they do. So the, the fact that your book isn't selling is because it's not as good a book as we all thought it was. And that's why it's not selling. It's not because we're not marketing it the right way, or we're not marketing it at all. And you know, I, I've sat here and listened to tales of woe at conventions. Tried to keep my mouth shut, which for me is very difficult because you know our mouths are bigger than our ears are long. So uh, that's that saying something. Yeah, um, but but one uh, lovely young author who you know she talked to me about her sales and I I was just biting my lip the whole time. It's like God, honey, you sold as many books in a year as I did in January. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be quiet now. And she talked about how they completely redid. She had this beautiful cover that she loved. They took it and made it look like a Twilight clone. Her book has nothing to do with Twilight. But, well, we're going to make this kind of appeal to the Twilight fan by making the cover look similar. So there's this really cheesy, generic looking cover. And she was devastated there wasn't a darn thing she could do. Yeah. You know, there's a great deal to be said for um, hanging on to some fat control if you can do it. And with a big six, you're not. Unless you're somebody already, they're not going to let you keep creative control. And that's 
in my opinion, one of the worst things. This is why my agent said, you know, Chris, I, I don't know that you and the big six are compatible. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually told somebody I knew damn well I wasn't. <laughs> um, no mystery there. No mystery there. Uh, I, I've had I've had some dealings with with a couple of the big houses when I was pitching stuff, uh, and I met some lovely people who I enjoy working with. But there are uh, there's at least one publisher that I refuse. If I get asked for an anthology to, to submit to an anthology that that they're putting out, I smile sweetly and say I don't think so. Uh, I don't like their attitude toward writers. I won't put up with it. I don't have to. Um, they can get somebody else to play their game because I'm not. Not my. That's not how I roll. Shut up. Um, <laughs> you think I'd be loud, dude? Uh, <laughs> no. On the other, I get in trouble just sitting there. It's amazing. I <laughs> then switch channels, dude. I can hear you. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, Did you I hear what Alan thought? Oh my God! Here, <laughs> um, we read it on your Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> my Facebook stays so generic, I, and I still know, get in trouble. I worked my butt off for six months, from the time the the reading period ended to the time this thing went to, to the printer, uh, to the point of canceling and the canceling convention trips. You know, going, no, I can't accept that invitation. I'm deep, deep in production week or month or quarter. Um, and, you know, if I had any sense, I'd never do it again. I'm not the brightest penny in the door. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed listening to the squeal of first and second right, sale writers when they got the acceptance letter without benefit of telephone. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I enjoyed the look on their faces when they got to the lunch party. And I enjoyed the hell out of selling out of half the first print run in two days. And crying on their lunch party. Mm -hmm. They were all just crying on their lunch party. Well, like, I think we're way. also going to yeah. have to redefine what is a mid-list writer. You know, well, I, I mean, it's not going to be a problem if things keep going. There won't be a mid. -list. No, there, there won't be. I, I, I think yeah. I think that's a term that's about to fade away. Well, um, it's been a it's been a ridiculously undefined term yeah, to start with. It's, it's been everyone who isn't self published and isn't on the times list. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> What kills me though is there are people on the times list absolutely losing their publisher, their shirts, and there were mid list writers that were the absolute Clydesdales, draft horses, s making money, mm -hmm. which just, just used to amaze me. Because uh, you, you would hear, because there would always be some scandal, there was some stupid scandal that somebody wrote this heart-rending book and then it turns out, oh yeah, none of that's real. <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. and they would, you know, they would lose gun. their publishing company millions of dollars. I think one of the things that when you look at publishers and you go, who's doing it right? One of the things that makes me sit up and take notice is somebody who grows their authors, who grows them through the steps of the career and gets right. to that to that big. You spot. look forward to book number three. I just heard a story yeah. from Rachel Aaron, who has she sold a five book series to Orbit, and they put the first three out. And they weren't doing as well as they expected, as they paid for, <laughs> okay. and the books weren't earning out. So, the the standard end of this story is: so I got dropped, and right. and they're not that putting out books more than five. Right. They're pulling all the they're pulling the books back. They're doing an omnibus edition of books one through three with a new cover. They're re doing new covers for each of the book, books one through three, and then they're going to tighten the release schedule for four and five to keep to keep momentum. After they release the omnibus, they're pushing wow. forward. That's, that's, that's good publishing. That's the kind that's of that's we don't that's hear that's enough of today. That's, that's, and that's, that's amazing, maximizing their investment. That's yeah, amazing. they've already paid the money, yeah. so now they're doing their G. Now they're doing the work to make sure they get it back. <laughs> they're a little late to the party, but they have come to the party, so this is a good yeah. thing. Yeah. We got about two minutes left. 
one of the things that I love about small presses is that, particularly when they are genre specific, uh, they will put more passion behind an author often than a, a large publisher will. They, you know, once because they are selective, they can only afford. Yeah, I can't, a certain I can't afford to put out 20 writers this week. Authors. I can't afford to put out Why do you think to right. not a lot? So, so the ones yeah. that you focus on are the ones that you are really head over heels passionate right. about. The ones that you really want to get behind and help succeed because when they succeed, you do. Um, if you didn't believe in them in the first place, you wouldn't take them on. And because you have this many resources, but you're putting them behind a limited number of authors, the passion for the work, I think, is, is one of the biggest benefits that we as authors can, can get. Uh, much better than being ignored or, or minimized by, or, you know, beaten up and raped and then forced to thank my assailant. Um, you know, as, as some of our, our friends have reported, their publishing experience. <coughs> So that this is, I think, you know, the small press in the Indies do have some um, moral advantages, morale advantages over some some other. Just real quick before we wrap, um, let's go down the line. And what other panel are you guys done for the weekend, or what other panels do you have, Chris? What's your next thing? Uh, uh, my next thing is one that probably no one will show up to: song and poetry and, uh, and fiction. Where and when? Morning. Uh, Candy schedule in the back. See? Panel room A, poetry and song. Right here, nine in the morning. So if you don't want to go to church. <laughs> uh, I'm doing steampunk at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I'm doing trends and fantasy at 11 a.m. tomorrow up in B. I'll be steampunking tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And I've got a reading at 10 o'clock tonight in D. So if you want to hear some smart alecky vampire fiction, I'll be in panel room D. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you.